Today I have a guest on somebody that I have been looking forward to having a conversation with for a long time. Now, uh, Mr. Kenneth Royce is the author of 15 books total, and one of them being a novel, 15 of them nonfiction. But the reason why that is important is almost 10 years ago, I was in Afghanistan on my, I think it was my sixth, my sixth deployment when I'd really decided to get into mm -hmm. reading. And I encountered a series of your books, uh, particularly ones referred to modules for, ma for manhood. We're going to post it so that people can see it. But one of the things that I appreciate about the first one, because I think this was when the first one came out, was how you had the, the, the books included a bit of not only breadth, but depth as well on a, mm -hmm. on a long surface, uh, series of topics. And so Mr. Royce has opted volunteered to join us on the show today would you introduce i was yourself? not coerced yeah i was not at all coerced hi i'm kenneth royce i uh, write also under the uh, pseudonym boston tea party initial t for tea party uh probably a lot of people know me more as boston versus kenneth royce because most of my first books were done under boston tea party and it became hey boston you know my, my nickname um i started writing in 80 Eight, eighty-nine. my first book called Goodbye April 15th, uh, discussing the uh, overreaching jurisdiction of the IRS and how many people, if they're just making a private sector paycheck, probably do not fall under Internal Revenue Code uh, uh, regulations. And you can free yourself from what was a, a tax on business profits that got morphed into around World War II a uh, sneaky tax on private sector wages. So I started that in 89 and that came out in 92. So I've been in this for about 31 years and have written a book on the average about every two years uh, in, in that time. Alrighty, so before we jump into this any further, this show has been, let's call it sponsored by uh, the audience still. And so people, if they if we want to join into part of the after party conversation, you can head over to redactedculture.locals.com. And then if you want to support us through merch, you can go to our store at redactedllc.com. And that's where you will find our we do have a current pre-order that yes, if you are on page with the gun culture, does include a pair of the shades. Don't overpay on Amazon. <laughs> cool. Don't overpay on Amazon for your Civil War shades, and there is a there is a there is a <laughs> there's a deeper tone to this, and this is something that I like to do is I like to try to put in subtle messaging. And the point on putting out a T-shirt with the shades was very simple. If they're going to use this as slings and arrows against us, and us being Americans, gun culture, or whatever you want to, you know, this this community that we're building. What we do right. is we proactively take that and turn it into something of our own power. Sure. Uh, it sounds a little bit mystical. It sounds a little bit like uh, voodoo. But the point is, is that it's kind of like the deplorables thing. When mm -hmm. Hillary Clinton called Americans deplorables, she did not. I don't think she recognized the amount of ammunition right. she gave her opposition because that phrase didn't single-handedly get Donald Trump elected, but it certainly had an impact in it. And so we're going to do the same thing as uh, A24's movie Civil War is coming out. Um, we're going to we're we are we're going to win the culture war ahead of them. So we're up against giants, but we'll make it work. Well, as the samurai said, my enemy's sword is my sword. You know, you can I, use the weapon of your enemy against them. I think that's how we have to do it. I mean, we did put out an episode recently on this idea that the ends justify the means and why it doesn't stand up in either moral philosophy or even mm -hmm. practicality. But I right. think, I think, I, and I wanted, I, oof, I want to hear your thoughts on it really quickly because we need to get into the heavy material. But hmm. um, what is your what is your take on that phrase? The ends justify the means. Uh, it's the the. Uh, escape of a of a coward it's the escape of a uh, of a pragmatist someone who is just wanting the end result and doesn't care how they go about it it's it's the creed of a psychopath quite frankly the end justifies the mead uh and to make an omelet you have to crack a few eggs that sort of thing yeah but that was uh, was that lenin or stalin i can't remember uh i think that was i think it was stalin and Hermann Goering uh, repeated it uh, of the Luftwaffe in World War II. So, and I, I forget okay. what context. 
Yeah, I know that it's I know that the phrase has has been it's like one of those phrases that gets stuck to different characters specifically around that mid 1900s era of yeah. uh, the new Amer new new world horror. Right. Yeah, I that's good to know. I think I appreciate the take though cuz I I oftentimes hear the phrase used in in a sense of exasperation. And what I mean mm -hmm. by exasperation is like Okay, let's let's see. the easiest one is kind of a socio-political model where a speaker is presenting this problem. Our our mm -hmm. enemies, whether they're Republicans or Democrats or whatever, um, they are willing to do things that we're not willing to do. They're willing yeah. to stoop to new lo levels because they are making the argument that ends justify the means. Therefore, we should fight fire with fire. Uh -huh. And and it's and and what I always get out of that is this sense of desperation. And yeah. that's that's never a winning strategy. Des desperation is cheap motivation. It's not a it's not a long term plan. So, right. but it's the last motivation. You know, if you become desperate, what else do you have beyond desperation? It's, it's that's the end. <laughs> so let's uh, let's let's turn a little bit to your writing here. Uh, now, yeah. I have a I have a couple of books of yours, and we've talked a little bit ahead of time, but the Let's start with the modules for manhood, particularly something that uh, that you put on the back of these books is. Yeah, this was this was 10 years. I think this is for me almost 10 years ago now. Um, but there was this idea of. I'm going to just read kind of the back cover uh, meeting our modern man, a 20 something still living at home, a hipster beta male existing only for video games, tweeting that the rest of us aren't enlightened. No testosterone, no skills, no job, no dignity, no girlfriend or wife, no self-reliance, no manliness. So the idea, and it's got a picture of Pajama Boy, which yeah. is a kind of a kind of a, uh, a, 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 I think a meme that is no longer as front and center as it used to be. Right. But the the question is, that was ten years ago, and how have you mm -hmm. seen that? culture from a from a bird's eye view how have you seen cultures shift and change around those perspectives i think we're seeing the beginning of young men starting to solid up um this this is going to take a while because the the uh the corrosiveness of the anti-men movement and uh, philosophy behind the scenes has taken a long time. And we're only now just waking up to, wow, this has actually been a war against men and manhood and masculinity for a long time. So we're only waking up that we've been under assault. Uh, the good things, the sea change I'm beginning to uh, witness especially in young men, is that I think there is now becoming obvious that young men are starting to want families. And this ties into uh, the fourth turnings take on what's called the new Victorians. Uh, I don't know if you've read the, the fourth turning, but it's a very interesting book. I have. And, and so we're seeing younger men becoming interested in getting married and having families. We're seeing a, a, a meta uh, shift a little bit. However, um, young men are, even though they're starting to, I think, desire families and becoming husbands and fathers, uh, they've got fewer tools to do so successfully just because they've been cheated of uh, milestones of manhood and uh, they're just not making young men like they used to. So even though they're starting to desire families, uh, I don't know if they're as capable in doing so. This is why I hope books like mine and the other books within the Ravenial men's movement uh, can have an effect. Okay, yeah. So I've been I've been reading and in the environment for a little while, and and I've seen some of the things that I've seen specifically within like the, the let's call it the masculinity world, because I know okay. that there's this thing over here called the manosphere, and then there are different right. individuals that have populated it. Some of them rising, some of them falling, some mm -hmm. of them no longer relevant. Other way, you know, and 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 it seems like as far as masculinity as a conversation i also grew up in a, a rather christian home where common books on the shelf in our circle would be things like wild at heart 
Um, mm-hmm. I, I didn't see, I didn't, I, I have found it, but it, it, I didn't, re- I didn't read it until I was an older person, but book, uh, the book by Farrar called Point Man. Um, and then there's mm-hmm. a, there, and, and in my research, I actually find kind of a long genealogy of these books written to men. Uh, there's, yeah. there's one on my, one on my shelf called Royal Manhood, which was, I think, written in the turn of the century. Uh, mm-hmm. so in early 1900s and one, it has one of the best chastising lines, where it refers to men as was like as just driveling little nobodies or something like that, and so and this is in 1900. <laughs> this is in, this is I think I think the book was written in like 1908. I have to find the quote and maybe we can pull yeah. it out later. But I'd have to disrupt everything going on here just to grab it. Yeah. So on the one hand, what I see though is that there's a little bit of like this is a, a never ending problem. There isn't right. there really isn't. Um, there isn't a Lord of the Rings moment or a Clausewitzian first attack where right. masculinity was under attack, unless you want to go back mm-hmm. to, say, the Garden of Eden. But mm-hmm. you do have this kind of progression going through history. Sure. And within masculinity, I what I have seen, especially within masculinity, and then in another, in another connected angle, which would be gun culture, which you've written mm-hmm. as a part of, uh, I, I, I have, I'm actually observing people sort of hit a fork in the road now where they either mm. they either become extremely cynical and and resentful towards the world or mm. they start they kind of peel away from the materialism of the 90s and mm-hmm. they are off and there's there's a revival taking place within people becoming Christians and seeking sure. after it's not even the tradition of it necessarily, but something of greater meaning than possession. Right. Have you observed yeah, anything yeah, include, like? Yeah, uh, definitely, uh, especially with the um, you know back to the land homesteading uh, mm-hmm. movement that I think we're seeing. People are getting back to the re- rediscovering basic values and a simpler way of life, usually with a family. And heading to the hills and growing their own food and raising their own children, uh, working with neighbors. And I make the point in one of the modules, if if you're a right-thinking man, but you have a corporate job and you're beholden to the system, they're going to compromise the, the extent of how you can exercise your integrity. So if you remove these these points of leverage against you, as far as how you make your money and and uh, who supplies your food and and so forth, if you can fix your own uh, things on the farm and grow your own food and be largely self sufficient for these important nodes of life, you can operate uh, with a high level integrity because no one can force you not to. You're not beholden. You're not a captive, and so much. So I, I think the homesteading movement is understanding this and really rejoicing sloughing off a lot of technology and materialism from the 90s as you put it and as jack donovan uh put it i think and i think also uh uh nasim taleb Mm -hmm. he said technology is the uh enemy of masculinity because it makes you soft it buys you off yeah so i think that's part of the homesteading you know movement so when I uh, when I get to sit here ten years later, I don't think it's so much of a coincidence, but I I, I very mm-hmm. much so remember a distinct deployment where I was on, uh, and it was actually one of the it was one of my favorite deployments. I was up in the coast region, up in the uh, northeastern section of Afghanistan, and I think on, on that deployment I read one of your books, "The Way of Men" by Jack Donovan. Anti fragile yeah. by Nassim Taleb and Ayn Rand's act, Atlas Shrugged, all in a row. <laughs> um, wow, it was a it was an it was an educational it was an educational deployment to be very clear. Oh, bad. Um, but I I think the the reason why I bring that up is is even now later I I guess I get to look back with with twenty twenty vision and say oh that was very formula for, formative. Um. Mm-hmm. So the question with technology, and what I want to bring up, I want to ask you this one here, is um, sometimes we get a little bit carried away with aesthetics. Let's just mm-hmm. say when the homesteading movement turns into full cottage core, 
Right. Like it's it's the look of being rustic, shiplap everything, um, or it gets carried away in this kind of idealism that well, if I can move away to the mountains, I'm gonna have mm -hmm. you know my cute garden and my regular schedule. And for a lot of young men, that seems like an unachievable outcome, where mm -hmm. they're they, they they you know that where they feel caught between some sort of that's an ideal that they cannot achieve. When I grew up in the 90s uh, and in the early 2000s in rural America, rural Midwest, the there was a lot of self-sufficiency in our area, but it was actually rather Midwestern depressing, probably put it mm. that way. Um, and, and so what I want to, what I'm curious on is, how do you separate the principles from the ideals when it comes to this idea of getting away from the corporate world and getting away from hyper technology, because I think sometimes it gets mistaken for sort of Ludditism. Mm. Well, there's probably two um, levels in that you can be still working for corporations, but remotely uh, from home and you can make your home anywhere you want to, whether it's a condo in San Francisco or a uh, mountaintop cabin in Wyoming. So remote work is maybe the first portal to that. Uh, beyond that would be actual entrepreneurship where you're uh, you know, running your own show with products and or services that you're selling, especially if they're, they're virtual, that can be done anywhere. Um, so technology can be certainly a friend, you know, back in the, in the 1990s when you had Midwestern, you know, kind of uh, dullness, in self-sufficiency, it doesn't have to be as dull today because technology can, technology can spruce that up, obviously. But you have to pick, and one has to pick and choose uh, their technology, sort of like the Mennonites do. They're different from the Amish. Uh, I, I ran into some Mennonite girls back in the 90s or 80s on a motorcycle trip in Pennsylvania, and uh, pretty girls talking to them in a Kmart, and uh, they drove away in a, a black shiny Buick. And, but they explain the difference in themselves as Mennonites versus the Amish. Uh, the Amish don't want a dishwasher at all, just out of principle. But at least the Mennonites will talk about, you know, should we get an electric dishwasher and how will that change our family life? Well, I enjoy washing the dishes with my sister kind of thing. And so a dishwasher would preclude that and they would decide at that functional level, you know, socially, it, it, it takes away more from us than it, than it adds. So at least they think it through, the Mennonites, where the Amish would just uh, not even consider a dishwasher. So I think in a way we should become technological Mennonites and pick and choose here and there where technology can help us versus take more away from our lives. And that's what I do. Um, I, I have some high points in technology in my life and then I'm kind of uh, kind of rustic in, in other ports. So everyone finds their own balance with that. and. I think over time that's going to synthesize sort of an, a new way of of living amongst people like us. It's certainly taking a bit of mastery over your environment because you yes. you choose which things you participate in, and I think that's right. a good one. Um, there's a there's an element of of I think there's an element where this reflects to gun culture, as in there's a rat race that can be run in the the human economy of america the new phone the mm -hmm. new shoes the new whatever um yeah. and and on on one end of the extreme you get the 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 proverbial keeping up with the joneses i have to have the latest x to be a part of y whereas right. on the other side of it and i and i this is where i think I, where i've seen it happen as well is you get people who are completely in rejection of all of this material and they would be kind of like that mm. amish perspective where uh, i don't want to deal with the the burden of thought that that might carry upon me so i'm going to reject all of it and it's sort of this yeah. return to ludditism where what you're arguing for is somewhere in the middle is the, are we doing mm -hmm. are we doing an aristotelian golden mean here where is that is that kind of your argument or is it something else i think people uh if they're they're perceptive and introspective are going to uh, look for the Aristotelian golden mean if they're picking and choosing here and there. 
uh, they'll find the right balance that works for them and their family. Uh, I don't know if there is a golden mean ideally that can be broadly applied, you know, to homesteaders or people going back to the land. Uh, people are just going to pick and choose. So then let's go back to that concept as well. People going back to the land. Is this something that, do you think it's something that's universally un, universally applicable to all men, or is this sort of a, some will make no. it, some will not? Okay. No. Um, not everyone wants to grow their own food. Not everyone wants to uh, plow their own, you know, half mile driveway. So no, this is not applicable to all men. But um, unfortunately, for the fellows starting to wake up, but are still urbanites, either by uh, choice or by uh, coercion, they, they really have no other option to make a money, make money at the time. And but by living in the city, uh, you can still have a garden. You can still live, you know, not right downtown, but somewhere towards at least the suburbs, and have. A, a little bit of the advantage of living in the country. Um, yeah, so then, in, I mean, sum, in in summarizing all three of your books together, mm -hmm. what is how are, how do you approach what good living looks like, especially for men? What's I would say, I would say uh, being able to cope with life at all levels and prevail is my idea of what I'm trying to do with modules for manhood. That's why there's 40 subjects amongst three books. Part of coping with life is knowing what not to get involved with and knowing what not to be uh, pressured by. Uh, I don't think one can go as far being a self-sufficient and all coping man still living in the city, still in the rat race. I think you're going to have to uh, gaze towards the countryside, at least somewhat. Um, especially if in the future, uh, food will be really important. Water will, will be really important. And if you're depending on food and water from uh, entities and uh, corporations and third parties and all that, you're really at a, at a disadvantage because the food today, industrial food, is, is completely awful and designed to create an unhealth syndrome to kill off the, the drones shortly after they reach retirement age. Uh, it's, it's mm -hmm. you know, we, we want you to be healthy enough to work until 65 and then die from, from who knows why, you know, you died at 67. And uh, the, the horrible food is part of, part of that uh, conspiracy. And it is a conspiracy. They and could it, sell us it, good food if they wanted to, they just don't want to. And if it didn't, and, and if that doesn't get you, we'll 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 artificially introduce some myocarditis for you. Yeah, and uh, who knows where that comes from? You know, they can uh, later claim it's like the movie. Uh, I think it's a civil action with uh, uh, Robert Duvall's in it, um, John Travolta, and so they sue a uh, a large chemical company for polluting the water. And in the depositions, the chemical company's attorney, Robert Duvall, is is asking all these uh, plaintiffs, well, you know, do you uh, eat from Teflon pans? You know, do you have mercury fillings in your teeth, uh, et cetera? Who, how do you know your sickness came from our, you know, product? You're doing all these dangerous things. You're eating all these other things. And it's a syndrome of, of, of unhealth and how can you pin it on us is what the corporations uh are falling back on as a defense you'll never be able to localize it uh to us myocarditis that why have you seen the big list that's accumulating of what causes myocarditis you know sunlight lack of sunlight too much ex exercise not enough exercise reading books uh watching tv uh, sports everything causes myocarditis everything except the vaccine so yeah well it's a it is a form of rhetoric and and, and i'm, I'm yeah. sure you're familiar but it's it's a form of rhetoric to make something that is clear unclear to, to, right. to it's it's artificial doubt i think that's the issue or yeah. um but uh, but ultimately i think that's an interesting problem too because of what it produces is that it gives justification for 
for that doubt. I mean, it's sort of a mm-hmm. from a governance standpoint. Let's even yeah. go back to statesmanship. It's a short term benefit for a long term consequence. It's a short term benefit. Mm-hmm. People will listen for a while, but ultimately they'll end up not trusting you. And I wonder if it is a symptom of our political system where uh, a president is only held accountable for his actions for four to six, four to eight years. And then after that, you know, unless you're unless you're Donald Trump, I suppose, then Hmm. good luck. Um, It's that is that is a political philosophy question that has to do with monarchism is like there's no consequence for it, whatever. Right. However, right. So, uh, so one of the things that I, I, I did appreciate your, about your book and, and before anyone gets any further into the podcast, I do have to admit that I'm going to be gushing a little bit over this because these were, I, I, I just, I think they are a good, a good book set of books to have on your shelf, particularly because how you do cover so many subjects, mm-hmm. you cover, you, you cover such a breadth of material, a breadth of material. And I'm just going to open up the first one here. And look at something like the um, the table of contents. I mean, the first chapter, the first section is understanding, and then we have thinking, truth, wisdom, and genius, and then we have integrity and character, and then conquering your fear, depression, laziness, anger, impatience, and pride. But then you get into indiv- individuality, courage, and manhood, getting along better with people, mm-hmm. communicating, persuading, action, negotiation, and selling, learning and training. That's just the first book. And then the second one covers subjects like teaching, using your time, solving problems, power, leadership, government, taxes, saving, money, health and exercise, fighting. And so um, there it, it, it calls to this idea of the of not specialization, like a man should Mm -hmm. not simply be a, a specialized individual he, he right. it, it's something about there's something about masculinity that has a, a a breadth of capability how did you how did how did you start selecting these projects how did you build it well the idea came from uh, jeff cooper founder of gunsight academy uh and jeff died in uh 2006 and one of his last columns that he wrote for, I think, Guns and Ammo magazine called Cooper's Corner, he said, uh, a young man, before he leaves his father's household at, at 18, should be able to know and do these things. And he had a, a pretty extensive list. And uh, that was sort of the mind worm you know, for me, because uh, there's a few things in that list that uh, I, I didn't know or could not do. Quite a few I could. But uh, thinking of the younger men, you know, of 2006, it's like they can't do any of this. They don't know any of this. Um, and Cooper's idea was a man should be able to cope. And I like that uh, that framework. And so once you start thinking along those lines, then you could then the list becomes exhaustive. Uh, so I tried to synthesize these things into concepts, um, about 40 of which. Um, over three volumes, and the third volume is is mainly about women and God. Because if you choose the wrong woman or the wrong God, you're in for a lot of trouble on this in this life and uh, possibly the next one. So, I, my job with these modules is not to do all the mining uh, for the reader, but to point out to take the reader through the mine shaft, the gold mine shaft and point to this particular portion of the wall and say, there's a vein of gold, you know, here, dig here. The digging's up to you. The hard work is going to be up to you, but I can at least point out where uh, the good places to mine are. And if they go through that and, and then, and they do the hard work, uh, they're, they're going to be much more capable and happy uh, for themselves and for their families if they choose to have one, which I hope they do. I hope we start to, you know, outbreed ourselves uh, away from some of this and not give up and go, I'm not bringing children into this horrible world. Well, it's horrible because you haven't brought your children into, you know, your good children into yeah. this world. Okay. So there's, uh, there's, let's, I'm looking at books on my shelf that I have from this one. I ended up reading a couple of them because of your excerpts. Now, mm-hmm. one of the things that well, I found, actually, I, I found it, 
both in both difficult and, and kind of unique at the beginning time is when when I started reading your book, the when I started reading these books, I, I, it, they're not written in like a smooth prose. And what I mean by that is when you expect mm -hmm. for for the for the audience, it's like when you pick up a book, you kind of expect chapters to be written in constant paragraphs where you mm -hmm. have this kind of flow and story, whereas yours are very much so like a like an outline that was actually made to be useful to the reader, not just to the author. So that's fair. Uh, yeah. Right. So there's, there's, there's complete thoughts in pages and then those right. will direct you to further material. So for example, yeah. I've got, um, the spirit of laws on, on my bookshelf now. Mm -hmm. Uh, that's, that's a very classic one. Then, and, uh, by Baron de Montesquieu, I have, uh, How You Can Find Happiness During the Collapse of Western Civilization by Ringer, and mm -hmm. a few other yeah. ones, um, some of Rudyard Kipling, um, and, and so on and so, so forth. And so I think it helped. It actually, I think in some ways it helped me build my library when I began, because my, my yeah. library is, is, is just about to encroach off, off, off to the second wall. Uh, it's getting kind of full. So good. Yeah. Well, I, I appreciate that. I, I, I do. And I'm so let's go back to um to J Jeff Cooper. Now I have no relation. I'm I'm not related to Jeff Cooper. But he I've read one of his books. What would you recommend for those who are interested in reading more of Jeff Cooper? And what do you think as far as in his what was it? What do you think was his great what was his greatest impact on both gun culture and masculinity? He he was the first one to uh, formalize a handgun shooting technique and the safety doctrine uh, behind it. Um, you know, before we had ten or more gun safety rules, and he uh, economized those into four, called the Four Rules. If anyone wants to look up, you know, the Four Gun Safety Rules by Jeff Cooper, mm -hmm. they're also in my books. And as a, a, a thinking man and, and a an historian, and he had a degree in political science as well, his, his basic assertion for the citizen was that defending yourselves against uh, lethal violence and criminal violence was not only your right, but your duty. It is, it is our duty to be armed and trained with a sidearm and to go about our daily business daily armed and thus pr creating a bubble, a crime-free bubble wherever we go and crowding out the activities of, of the criminal. Um, as far as the masculinity part of it, you know, carrying a gun is, is, a, is a forceful um, uh, projection of yourself and your right to live. And I think that's inherently masculine, even if women do it. And, and they should. I think women sh should be armed. Uh, but if most more men were, then women wouldn't have to be. It's, it's a shame that women have to be armed because not enough men are. So carrying a hand, handgun and being able, being willing to deploy it in a lethal emergency, emergency is a masculine skill, a masculine attitude. So by the by, just virtue of of raising the gun culture as Cooper did, it, it raised the masculine aspect of being armed and being willing to defend yourself. So I, I think his his impact was huge. Then uh, when he founded Gunsight in the early '70s, you, you had all these later uh, instructors. You know, start from there: Louis Auerbach, uh, Clint Smith, Chuck Taylor. I think Masad Ayub uh, was related to gun sight in the early days. And so he had the, the, the next generation of gun instructors came from gun sight. He was the real fount of a lot of people, uh, including myself. I, I didn't go until the uh, very early 90s, but I became an instructor of a, of a minor note and activity later. And I credit a lot of what I learned from gun sight and then Thunder Ranch, uh, Clint Smith's school and his philosophy is, is excellent. So being able to cope, being able to defend yourself is part of being cope is, is coping in life. And uh, Cooper brought that alive. 
And you, know, you couldn't go anywhere else, you know, from the 70s, 80s, and 90s, but Gunsight, if you wanted to learn how to, you know, the modern pistol technique. As far as which book of his to read, probably start with uh, PPD, The Principles of Personal Defense. It's a tiny little book. Uh, he's got several hardcovers uh, thereafter, like uh, Sea Change, No uh, uh, to Ride to Shoot Straight and Speak the Truth is also a great book amongst his hardbacks. A lot of personal yeah, stories, I, vignettes and with, with, a, with a message. And he's, yep. uh, Jeff Cooper was a, a very good uh, wordsmith, a, a very good author. I don't think he gets enough credit for being as good an author as he, he really was. Uh, he's a great stylist and a champion of the English language. So he's a pleasure to read just in that regard. I have I have only the only book of his that I've read is to ride shoot straight and speak the truth and yeah it was an it was an interesting read because I think I it was 2015 16 17 time frame when I read that one and so mm -hmm. you got to see you got to see some of the influence of his writing and how it affected the gun culture later and how some of it aged yeah. well and some of it didn't like for mm -hmm. example, he was he didn't he he was a he was an avid critic of the nine millimeter, uh, right? Which which I thought was you know which which he was an avid critic of the nine millimeter, but this is where I see discerning readers be able to pick what he wrote about and mm -hmm. find the value because if that's what kind of derails your reading of of Cooper, then you're missing all the fruit because of one broken branch. And that's yeah, and he a, died in 06 and a lot of things have improved the nine millimeter in, uh, you know, 16, 17 years. Mm -hmm. So I want to, I kind of want to go back to this is, I know we're getting a little bit meta, maybe meta isn't the right word, but I want to go back to on the back of the book you use on the back of your books modules, you use, it, you use a, aesthetics to mm -hmm. draw a distinction between a 23 year old a couple generations ago versus a 23 year old in today's era and right and and the for description and if i can get a picture up here but for description you've got for today's representation you have this pajama boy whereas 23 years or for whether whereas in the past a 23 year old man was expected to have all these skills and he have a guy fly, flying mm -hmm. a fighter jet who's going to come home and raise a family. Yeah. Now, when it comes to attitudes, I could imagine somebody I could imagine. I've seen this before in the world and I'm, and I'm trying to hone in on it. So I apologize for the, the painting of the picture, but there are examples of men who have all the aesthetics of being masculine. They have they they wear the flannel. They have the beard. They do various hard things. They run the tough mutters, but when right. they get when they when they enter into culture, philosophy, and politics, their mm -hmm. demeanor is indistinguishable by content from whining. Hmm. If we were the the culture doesn't let us be men, or or the the there's this there's this very there's this attitude that is buried within the masculinity movement, which I, I, I'm trying to uncover a little bit, which has to do with complaining. We complain hmm. about feminism. We complain about the lack of math men in the world. We complain about jobs and structures and corporations. Mm -hmm. And the reason why I have a challenge with this is because while the content is inherently trying to provide masculinity, the mm -hmm. attitude is still in this sort of to use internet language cucked beta male mentality which is mm -hmm. something like if only the culture or the society would allow me to be a man by giving uh -huh. me my right of passage and my eight my 40 acres and a, and a whatever then the world would be better the mm. problem that I have with that is that you're expecting the very persons that you are claiming to be the ones infringing on your rights to suddenly stop and then justify it or mm. su suddenly stop and then give you all of the fruits of your labor. Am I am I painting this picture clear enough or do I need to be a little bit more thorough? No, I, I, I see the picture you're painting. So 
this is a, a challenge that I've had in reading some of these are, are some some of the material that's written to men, some of the masculinity movement stuff, which is is this sort of let's call it bravado complaining. <laughs> um, you have all of the trappings of being a man, but when it comes down to a vital part, they're still asking for permission from somebody who they would otherwise describe as unworthy of giving it. How do you address that mm -hmm. problem? And do you think it's gotten better or worse? Well, the picture you're painting, you've probably drawn the oils and the water paints from uh, men going their own way or the manosphere kind of posts and books. Um, and I'm not as, as well acquainted with that as, as you apparently are. Um, for, for myself and for my readers, if you know why complain that you know, the, the the man hasn't given me my 40 acres or uh, women won't date me well what can you do about that how can you go out and earn your 40 acres or how can you um learn to woo a woman better it, you know, it's still on you so I'm, I'm not into the complaining and the victimhood while having a costume party manhood you know draped on on myself i guess that's a good start if you're wearing flannel and you go work out and you can run the tough mutters that's a good start these things could seep you know deeper into uh, one's psyche and make a change from there um but i i try to avoid the complainer so i'm not seeing as much of that as as you have and it's probably more of an issue you know, to be addressed or thought of uh, that I know about. So uh, I'll look into it. All right. Because, yeah, I, I, I think it's a, it's a subject that needs development and, and I'll, I'll have to readdress it at a, at a later date. There's yeah. I'd another... like to see some examples of it. Uh, if you could send me some links or you know, where you see this most often, because uh, I'd like to acquaint myself with more of what's going on. I, I'm not in the, the, uh, masculinity manhood movement per se. I've written some books that I think are very appropriate, uh, but I haven't made tried to make myself a personality in that, and I haven't made a, quite an in-depth subject subject uh, a study of that subject. Uh, I just started out with, look, you know, guys, you need to know this and be able to do these things. Mm -hmm. um, it, 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 uh, not overcomplicating it. I appreciate that. So. Yeah. Another example of it that I, I look at, and this is where I think philosophy is really important here, especially mm -hmm. for gun culture, is that there's this attitude that's presented. And I, and I want to kind of use the same model, but draw it in a different picture. But there's this, there's this attitude that's presented that if only the state would let us use our right to bear arms to defend ourselves, we wouldn't have all <laughs> these problems. And, you, yeah. and you, made, you made that statement, defending yourself is not only a right, but your duty. And so... Yeah. Um, how have you what so can you describe gun how, what you what I, I use the word gun culture to refer to a specific thing that I've grown up in now you talked about being mm -hmm. becoming involved in it in the early 90s which means you've been doing this long about as long as I've been alive about how have that, you seen yeah. the how have you seen the fabric of what I'm referring to as gun culture if that is mm -hmm. the, if there is a correlation there shift and change in that time it's uh, quite a bit has happened. Um, when you were a boy, uh, or probably before you were alive, I'm talking about the 70s, uh, handguns were nearly outlawed in this country nationally because Handgun Control Inc. Uh, had big sway politically and socially. And at that time in the 70s, very few people uh, carried a gun daily. Uh, very few states would allow you to carry a gun. There are open carry states back then and even today, uh, which I didn't know about. You know, growing up in Texas, I had to go to gun site in Arizona and and learn what an open carry state was. And within two years, I moved out of Texas into an open carry state. Um, so what has changed a lot in the gun culture is, is the uh, size of it. We have millions, many millions of new shooters, new gun owners, new people carrying daily. Uh, we've had the expansion first with the uh, concealed carry you know, permit laws that, that morphed into shall issue from may issue. And uh, I think 40 states now are shall issue, where if you're not a Title 18 prohibited possessor of firearm, 
if you apply for a concealed carry permit in one of those 40 states, it, it will, it must be issued to you. That it was, was a huge Bruin, change. I, I believe it was either the Bruin or the Heller case, which essentially made May issue schemes uh, or, or it declared that may issue schemes were unconstitutional. So that now effectively every state is a shall issue state. Now there are certainly yeah, ones that are breaking the rules, but. Yeah, there, there are very few states that are still trying to hold on. You know, uh, obviously New York would be one of them and D.C. and all that. But the Heller case of 2008, the Supreme Court finally said, yes, the Second Amendment is an individual right and not a collective right for the state militia. Uh, since the the shall issue uh, uh, dam broke, and about forty states are, are sh shall issue, if 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 not the the other ten becoming shall issue because of Heller. Since then, you've had the the rise of the uh, constitutional carry states. It's basically the Vermont uh, uh, paradigm of the, there's no law. Uh, requiring you to get a license to conceal or open carry. It's just your right to carry a gun. And so that's called was called Vermont carry. And then Arizona, Wyoming, and Alaska uh, picked up on that and became a wave. And now over half the states are so-called constitutional carry states. You don't have to get a permit at all to conceal carry as long as you're not a prohibited possessor. Uh, this was unthinkable uh, in the 80s that this, this would happen. In fact, the the shall issue uh, phenomenon was unthinkable and, and, until it began to happen, and that, and it's even improved into the constitutional carry you know wave, and so we're we're starting to see it, a, a true, uh, truly recognized and tactically useful Second Amendment uh, philosophy. It's to keep and bear arms means to own and carry guns. It's that simple, and you don't have mm -hmm. to be part of the militia and in the militia in order to exercise that right. You can do that individually where you are, where you live in over half the states right now. Uh, so that is huge. When when England restricted to almost nothing the, the right to uh, own a handgun, they could only do so because only 3% of, of Brits at that time owned a handgun. And so it was very minority held, you know, right or privilege and then they whittled, whittled it away to about zero. In this country, the, the expanse of gun owners is, is, is probably trebled in, in 30 years. We have more guns in this country than citizens, uh, which is, I, I think, a great sign. And we're the only country that has more guns than the number of, of population. And so th the fact that we have soccer moms carrying a Walther PPK you know, daily and enjoying shooting because shooting is fun and having all sorts of instructors, even if it's just the eight hour course for a concealed carry permit, uh, people can get decent basic instruction anywhere these days. That wasn't the case 30 years ago. So I, I think I think we take that for granted. I really do. I wonder I, I wonder if we do yeah. maybe put it that way is that you, you hear this, you hear rumblings and complaints within the world about with, what more training could we get? Could there, why are, why aren't mm -hmm. there more CQB classes for civilians or long distance reconnaissance, or let's just call it battle drill one alpha react to contact, break contact, enter and clear a trench kind of classes mm -hmm. taught to civilians. And right. what you're saying, what I'm hearing from you is that 30 years ago, you were lucky if you could find any sort of teaching. Oh yeah, you had to go to a big box school. You had to go to a gun gunsight or Thunder Ranch, uh, front sight in uh, uh, Nevada came a little later, but you generally had to go to a big box school. There were a few um, uh, roving instructors, uh, and perhaps they came through a, a neighborhood near you, but there weren't enough to satisfy what should have been a great demand. Uh, now there's just no excuse. There's there are people are finding training anywhere the apple seed program have you heard of that where I'm, I'm familiar yeah where history and marksmanship uh, met you know in 1775 and that's a wonderful brainchild uh by fred at m14 stocks where you just show up with your 22 and your son or your daughter or your whole family and you learn basic 
uh, natural point of aim, breathing, and, and so forth. And you learn how to fundamentally shoot a rifle. And you can take that to an AR-15 or an M1A or, or a bolt action gun later. But the Appleseed program was, was an amazingly uh, brilliant idea that just swept the country. And the apple seeders became instructors. So it was self-generating and self-growing. It wasn't relying on some cadre of instructors from on high. Uh, the apple seed became a grassroots movement. It's still going on today. Uh, yeah, I, I, um, I remember getting out of the military and discovering it. It was that's yeah. pretty much what happened. So I discovered the Appleseed program, and I knew somebody who was participating, and he invited me to come out one day, and so we did that. We did a, uh, we did the whole Appleseed thing, right? Are, are you, know, you a rifleman, rifleman, or are you a cook? <laughs> Do you score well, Do you? <laughs> I, I mean, I, I have, I grew up, I grew up shooting. So yeah, my, right. the, sh you know, the story on my end being, my grandfather was a, a veteran of World War. Both of my grandfathers were veterans of World War II. But my grandfather was a veteran of World War II, and he was in Korea. He was a prisoner of war in Korea. But he was also one of those people who I would probably describe as one of the most gifted marksmen that I've ever known. And it was yeah. in that very classic American way of just no nonsense. Right. And so he really did, he really did personify that kind of American who preferred a pre-64 Winchester barreled yep. in two two barreled in like two 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 Remington and or two 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 was it two 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 whatever he it wasn't a two two three it was a two 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 and he had your very classic kind of Walmart off the shelf scope but it was a Leopold and it, yeah you know it didn't it didn't have your 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 tree in it it didn't have all of your dope but he was just a very very excellent marksman yeah uh now but then so i grew up occasionally visiting him um mm -hmm. life was a very he, he lived a very hard life and so there were times where he became extremely bitter but i i wow. I, I, I learned how to shoot from him and from my father and then i went into the military and then i learned how to fight and then i then I got out of the military and I went into contracting and started shooting competition and I learned how to shoot mm -hmm. and I learned how to shoot well and fast and clean. Uh, and then I just kind of continued it on. And so I've always been more skilled. I've always had, I've had, I've had, I've, but I, and I've grown up in that part of the culture, but yeah, the point being said is, um, uh, you know, there there are plenty of competition. Most competition shooters that are in there who have been given ratings will probably beat me in a competition stage. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I'm, I'm I know where I fit in that one. I'm no grandmaster yet, right. um, but and and we all shot whatever it was expert in Ranger Battalion. Yeah, but that was sort of mandated. You kind of did it until you right. passed. Um, right. You know, and I was never, I was never last in the list to get, you know, make sure my badge was up to date or whatever. Uh, I, mm -hmm. I, I took some pride in my ability to be a marksman. Yeah. But something that I'm, I'm interested in is how that has led us to where we're at today, where I'm looking at the culture side of gun culture and seeing how things have mm -hmm. changed. Because yeah. I'm curious. How you how you've seen you've uh, let me ask this have you seen how like in my life ten years ago owning an AR fifteen was kind of being at the cutting edge of gun culture and now mm -hmm. in twenty twenty three it's night vision plate carriers ghillie suits yeah. thermal thermal yep you know uh, we're working on a project with AGM Global and mm -hmm. they're you know they're providing thermal technology and so. And they're one example of it, right? And so then all of this is now the cutting edge, whereas 10 years ago, having an AR-15 or even having a short-barreled AR-15 was mm -hmm. like, that guy's on the, on, he is on the front edge of gun culture. And how have you seen that attitude change in the, in the, he's, in this, he's this got city? a tritium front sight. Ooh. Yeah. Ooh, yeah. Now you're like, Back oh. yeah, let's see. I don't have. I don't have any. Uh, I don't have any of them in the room right now. But uh, at least that's what the that's what the uh, that's what everybody needs to think. 
Yeah. Well, Clint Smith at Thunder Ranch says, when the balloon goes up, uh, in three days, we'll all be using iron sights. Meaning technology and, and, and all the, the, the Zorchi stuff is fun, but uh, you've got to have the basics down. And, you know, if, if your tritium goes out or, you know, your thermal goes out or your scope, you know, uh, craps the bed, uh, it's back to iron sights. It's back to front sight press and natural point of aim and all that. So he's he's all about the basics. And I like, you know, the, the technology to a point. I used to go to SHOT Show every year. And uh, in fact, I was going to SHOT Show before the tactical world had its own hall. It used to be sprinkled out. All that stuff was sprinkled out through the show. Now they've got a big hall of their own. Uh, and it's just gotten crazy. So Americans love to be Batman in the boondocks and you know have all the the cool belt and uh, the bells and whistles uh i hope we don't lose the basics where a all you really need is a hard hitting hunting rifle or, or an iron sighted ar-15 uh, to do your job you really don't need all this stuff it could be nice here and there but if you can't fight and win with you know a bolt action savage 308 or a glock nine millimeter then you know you don't have your basics solid enough Okay. I, yeah, I travel so with an M1 Garand. You know, I travel with an M1 Garand because it's a 50 state rifle. If I get pulled based. over, yeah, it's just, it's just ba like it's it's hilarious. Like it, I I like it. I, I it's a it's a bit of a persona. I'll admit. Yeah, I mean, I'm not going to be up against Russian wave, you know, Soviet uh, army wave infantry tactics. I don't need an MP44. Uh, you know, my my Garand will get me out of the city is probably why I, I want it with me wherever I go is to fight my way out of the metropolis. And, you know, so how have, you, how have you seen the mindset change within our within a spe, uh, both gun culture and the masculinity world? And I want to mm -hmm. I want to hone in on one specific item. And that it goes back to that Jeff Cooper quote is that. So much of gun culture is seems to be focused on that you have the right to defend yeah. yourself, but you made the you made the statement that it is your duty. And then those yes. are very very different ideas, particularly. Uh, right. Go ahead. I'll, I'm gonna. I want to hear this. Yeah, I th I think the the fact that we have an individual right to keep and bear arms uh, that's pretty universally held amongst. A lot of Americans, I think even a majority of Americans, where we're not yet there is uh, the duty to keep and bear arms because that gets into responsibility. Rights are one flip side of the coin. The other is the responsibility. Uh, freedom is the same thing, freedom and rights. And then on the other side of the coin is the responsibility. That's why I think that freedom is not going to be a huge you know, product for people to uh, buy and absorb because they f fundamentally understand that, okay, if I'm free, I'm now responsible for my freedoms. And so people are happy to live with less freedom because they want to live with fewer responsibilities. They mm -hmm. understand that that's part of the game. They want to be kept teenagers living in a nice house and using daddy's car and all that, but they don't want to have to pay for the mortgage. They don't want to have to pay for the car insurance, you know, metaphorically. I think Americans are spoiled teenagers. They're not sheep. I don't think that's the, the most helpful uh, metaphor. I think uh, spoiled teenagers is more accurate. So how far can gun culture advance into uh, uh, asserting our duty to uh, defend ourselves? I think that's going to find its limits pretty soon because people don't want duty, people don't want responsibility. But that has grown in the gun culture. We're seeing people actually wearing their guns day in, day out. We're seeing more and more reports of crimes being stopped by the average citizen on the street, including mass shootings being stopped uh, on the street. And in fact, civilians kill two to three times more bad guys justifiably per year than the police do. And that's been the case for, for many years. Yeah, the uh, like we talked. I think we we might have brought this up before the show, but the the attitude being gun control as a moral philosophy is losing, and it's losing yes. in in yeah. desperate strides. Yeah. Now, sometimes it feels a little bit like the darkness before the dawn, but mm -hmm. I think 
something that I think gun culture can do now is it can start formulating what that looks like. Mm -hmm. What does it look like when we no longer are arguing with children and fools and tyrants over whether or not I have the right to defend myself and now start looking at how do we build a discernment and duty in one another, particularly right. in regards to that example i i find it you know i this is one of those things that i that they just kind of i don't want to say grind my gears but it 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 it, it stands out we tell we raise children now we being let's just say the the good ones it's going to be a little bit mm -hmm. i know it comes across as derogatory but let me put it that way we or just as a hand handle for the conversation yeah but we we we, we, we have like uh, it's the 20 year anniversary of the return of the king coming out in film the Lord of the Rings mm -hmm. is the film that I grew up on. In my generation, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the prior generation had Star Wars. We had Lord of the Rings, mm -hmm. and and Lord of the Rings was the movie that defined my young my young life for mm -hmm. sure. Um, and in that movie, characters voluntarily put themselves at risk for this for their duty to whether it's Frodo carry the ring to Mount Doom or Aragorn's whole story arc is taking on mm -hmm. the duty of being the king. And so mm -hmm. you even have this idea that the duty of the man is to fight the dragon and save the kingdom, save the princess, save the whatever it is, right? We have these kind of stories. And the cynic says, well, those stories aren't real. Whereas the wise man learns how to understand those stories within our worldview and within our environment. But yet when a person voluntarily puts himself at risk in order to defend his community what we mm -hmm. see in cities like minneapolis is that that man is demonized as a vigilante and then locked up behind bars and mm -hmm. and that is the attitude that i think is 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 kind of the next layer that needs to be defeated we're winning on the gun rights the right to own mm -hmm. and bear arms I think what we need to win in culture is the right, the duty, a person who does right. that, who stops the, the, you know, the, the criminal or whatever it is. I, you know, someone breaks into your house and you shoot them. That person isn't just, he's not a hero per se, but he, he, he didn't just defend himself valiantly. He did his duty to his, his, his neighborhood, mm -hmm. his family. And that needs to be right. honored on that level, not glorified right. into a kingdom, but, honored isn't like yeah he did the right thing yeah well i mean he, he is somewhat of a hero uh mm -hmm. and, and i think we're talking about a a return for the appreciation of heroes and heroines uh and that that runs deep in american culture um mm -hmm. you know lord of the rings written by tolkien you know back in the age of uh, gilbert keith chesterton and, and c.s lewis all three of them knew each other and kipling uh the heroic man uh and i think it's wonderful that a story from 120 years ago 100 years ago is made into a, a marvelous you know uh triune of feature films and it was seminal for you you know in your, in your generation and so I, I think americans have always appreciated the hero and uh you know maybe we'll start to back the hero more than we have and become the hero more than we have how would you inspire how would what what is some encouragement you have for young men who are on that line between choosing to be the hero and struggling with cynicism i, th I think they need to recognize that uh, cynicism is is endless as <laughs> as the line goes the problem with cynicism is that it's so hard to keep up you know, just when you think that you've reached the the level of cynicism that's appropriate to the culture, the culture has curdled further, and then you need to be more cynical still. Um, I, I think for young men, they need to realize that uh, cynicism is, although temporarily satisfying here and there, it's it's a losing game in the long run, and you just have to master your local environment as much as you can, and then you'll have less to be cynical about. Um, I made a point in one of my speeches in New Hampshire um, about 10 years ago 
I, I do not personally believe that there's going to be some libertarian renaissance that's going to remake society and we're going to live generally happily and free, you know, hereafter kind of thing. I think we'll always be hassled on the road as far as right to travel goes. I think we'll be hassled, you know, if you try to create an alternative money. I think we'll be hassled if we try to grow our own foods and keep t- taking vitamins and uh, et cetera. And so there's there's just a, a natural level on this planet amongst humans of, of uh, coercion and government that we're not going to completely escape from. You can minimize it. You can uh, avoid some of it. You know, for people that live in, in city uh, jurisdictions, they're voluntarily living in the one government jurisdiction they could avoid. You could live in the county and avoid the city. You can't avoid the county. You can't avoid the state or the feds, but you can avoid city you know, government. And if you're not, uh, you have to ask yourself why. So there are some ways to reduce the level of coercion that's that's foisted upon us. Um, but you've got to become strong in other areas to make that as almost irrelevant in your life as possible. Like gravity, we, we don't notice gravity. It takes effort to get out of our chair, to walk around and so forth. But as long as you're not bedridden, gravity is just not a problem for you know your ambulatory life. And we need to have that same kind of attitude with government. It's like, okay, there's the gravity of government we're just not going to completely get rid of, but you can become strong and go about your daily business and it doesn't phase you. It doesn't bother you as much as a bedridden person would complain about gravity. But someone who's strong and works out and running, uh, you know, normal earth gravity is just really not a problem. And that's where we need to get to as as men. It's that, okay, you know, you can whine about the gravity of government or you can become strong enough to uh, displace it and make it basically irrelevant. And I think that's the way to go. Okay, so I think the cynic would respond with that saying, you can't possibly as an individual become so powerful that government is irrelevant. And the, the, tr- the, the, the truth that makes that attractive is... Is the fact that yes, no one man can su- supersede or or or, or, or mm-hmm. overcome government itself, but mm-hmm. I think the lie that it it buries in there is justification for inaction. Yeah. Well, you you can't create the libertarian utopia, so you might as well eat, sleep, and watch Netflix because tomorrow we continue on in the same way. Yeah. Okay. Well. Uh... You can't cover the world in leather, but you can cover your own foot in leather. And so that's to the true. foot that's covered in leather, it's as if the planet is covered in leather, as far as your foot knows. So you can live your own local life that is pretty free of government, if you really think it through. And uh, it's as if you've eliminated government from the planet, if you've mostly eliminated it for yourself. So free yourself first link up with other people who have also freed themselves as much as they can and when that spreads government has to retreat just like darkness has to retreat with a single candle right a Mm -hmm. a single candle can do a lot of of pushing darkness back and the single examples of people living freely especially if they're growing their own food and they have entrepreneurial uh, income, especially several sources of that, they've diversified and they're not um, reliant upon one particular industry or product. But if they have lots of side hustles going, and they're trading, you know, with gold and silver, cash, barter, Bitcoin, or whatever, uh, after a while, living like that, after a while, you never think of government really anymore. Uh, you can almost make government irrelevant, especially if you're living in a in a more freedom state, and if you're in the in the country in a good county, and you've got some neighbors. Government is almost uh, uh, a concept at that point, merely a concept. One thing that I fear is that what you're talking about seems unattainable for people in our age. Now, mm-hmm. there's a, there are cultural parallels to this. One of them being. Um, the, the the millennial struggling to buy a home let's just let's yeah. use this as you know let's use this as an example and i think this is a good one to address because 
part of my problem is that people are complaining about the banks and the governments creating a system where you as an individual cannot possibly afford to buy a home. In the normal sense with a mortgage. Yeah. Y- yes. And then the That's other true. side of it, the, so it, it just seems like it's a screaming of extremes in this one. Uh, but let me use this one as an example. Or let me let me ask you on this one. For many people in my generation that aren't just young men in their 20s who are pissing away their life doing whatever, but they're in their Mm -hmm. 20s and they're trying, they they are on, they are earnestly trying to figure it out and they feel like they're up against a mountain. That mountain is like, is looking at a starter home is $400,000 and your wage you're going to get paid is going to be $1,575. Like that's yeah. not a realistic outcome unless you get involved in the corruption of Washington D.C. or sell yeah. your soul to a corporation. You are going to be making seventeen dollars an hour or twenty-four dollars an hour, um, right. and you're going to. Tr- so, so there, there. And this is that where that cynicism seeps in. What do you have to say for young men who want to ach- want to pursue this ideal that is sort of an, a, a golden mean between mm-hmm. homesteading? independent living but also that sense of duty because i think Mm -hmm. duty and independence are in proper tension with each other Mm -hmm. um you can't be perfectly autonomous but you also are not your your sense of duty has to be voluntary in some sense your participation in duty has to be voluntary you cannot coerce duty you can only inspire Mm it yeah and so what do you say to young men who are in that position where they are looking for they're in the they are in the trenches let's just put it that way they're in the trenches mm-hmm. trying to figure out how to work in that direction and some days they can't see it yeah well theodore roosevelt had has a great line he says do what you can with where you are and what you have start from where you are what you have what you know and improve upon that. Now, we have 50 states in this country, and it matters which states you live in. There are some states uh, that are so uphill as far as getting by in life because of of their intrusive government and uh, incessant regulations that it just doesn't make sense to live in Connecticut, Washington, D.C., California, People are leaving the so-called blue states for the red states. That's a phenomenon that everyone's talking about. Um, Moving, yeah, I know relocating to another state, especially a distant one, is expensive and, you know, fraught with uncertainty. But you've got to improve your current situation any way you can. Uh, It would be silly trying to uh, become a homeowner living in Los Angeles or or San Francisco, or almost anywhere in California. When you could move to Nevada would be better. Arizona would be better in that regard. Um, Idaho. Even for Californians, moving to Washington and Oregon is an improvement, if that says anything. And I've lived in both Washington and Oregon, and uh, they're they're horribly curdled liberal states. There's no reason for uh, a fellow like me or you to live in the left coast. Now that gives up, you know, the oceanfront view and, and, and all that, but uh, you can't have everything. So improve your situation. If you live in a sucky state, move. And that was the whole premise behind my novel, Molon LeBay. It's like if you're a homeschooler in Delaware, you know, being hassled for it, why are you still there? Come to Wyoming. You know, if you're a gun owner in uh, Illinois, why put up with that? Come to Wyoming. If you're a small businessman in California, tired of the taxes and regulations, move, come to Wyoming. It's not heaven, but it's certainly a lot better than where you were. And then from there, you're going to accumulate with uh, other like-minded people. Uh, Every time it's unreasonable to go, go go ahead. Sorry. Every time I've tried to go to Wyoming, I've ended up in a motorcycle wreck. What? Yep. Yep. (laughs) You mean before you left the state, or as soon as you got into Wyoming? Uh, uh, two, in 2013, I was in, I was hit in a head-on collision that was completely caused by the other person uh, in yeah. Laramie, Wyoming. Okay. Yep. So uh, I, I, uh, a man pulled out of a. Uh, what was it? He pulled out of a uh, a country club or something and just 
smashed right into me. Uh, and then wow. in 2000, and I think it was 19. I can't remember. Uh, my family was driving out. My my uh, let's call it posse was driving out to Wyoming, and I got a death wobble and crashed. Right. So there's a it's a it's a bit of an inside joke, but Wyoming. Um, <laughs> I didn't mean to completely derail it. I just think it's kind of funny that like oh, oh Wyoming's yeah, such a right. place. Like every time I've tried to go there, I've died. I've almost died. Um, huh. Well, maybe something's trying to prevent you from uh, getting there and and freeing yourself. I don't know. <laughs> we did Death move. wobble. My, did yeah, you? My yep. My family and I we moved from Minnesota to Arizona, which is a oh, much good. longer move. Yeah, it's a, it's a much longer move, but yeah, um, I've lived in I, Arizona. I can, it's a wonderful state. It's it's you know it's got its challenges, but I yeah. I can attest to the difficulty of moving. It is certainly yeah. not. It's not like you just. It's not. It's not greener pastures. It's mm -hmm. retilling the soil for something that you don't have, mm -hmm. uh, and it's, it's it's a difficult time. Yeah, but it, there, there's been good in it. So getting back to, I need to. I need. I, I apologize. I think I derailed you a little bit on that one. The. Well, it's okay. I was pretty much said what I what I meant to. The mindset that I I'm looking for, and there's and I can every once in a while see it, kind of like a flicker of light or a flicker of hope, is this deliberate mentality to separate oneself from perpetual reaction, and instead say mm -hmm. I'm going to take ownership over at least this little pit part of my life, and then right. it carries you a step forward. Right. Um, Moving it certainly requires that of you, I think. It, it mm -hmm. certainly requires that of you, and, and I appreciate that. What is um, What are some books that you have read that, that inspired you, mm -hmm. that, 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 that were seminal or important books that you've read in your life that really cut to the quick? What sort of got me going, you know, like the four books you read in Afghanistan in 2014, so that similar example for me uh happened a little earlier in my life and you were what, what 23 i would have been 20 I would, I would have been about 24 yeah okay 24, 24, uh from for me it would have been age 17 to 19. uh atlas shrugged and the fountainhead were in there uh i think ayn rand is a, a great place to start but not a great place to finish in a lot of Agreed. ways. Uh, Doug Casey, um, who wrote uh, The International Man, uh, How You Can Profit from a financial, the Coming Financial Crisis. Uh, Doug's books were big in the late 70s when I was a teenager. Heck, uh, by the time I was a junior in high school, I uh, had my own foreign bank account because he, he convinced me it was a good idea to expatriate some of your money. Not that I had a lot of money you know, in, as a junior in high school, but I was buying gold and had a foreign bank account that early. So Doug Casey, Casey was certainly seminal. And he became a friend later. I started going to his heiress society uh, meetings in uh, Snowmass, which he had uh, up until a few years ago and, and chaired the 2001. But he and I met actually in person in 89 and then i went to my first heiress in 94. so doug's been a big influence in my life uh both in books and 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 also as a friend and a mentor uh jeff cooper's uh book and philosophy and going to gunsight made a big impact on me uh earlier earlier on um i would say those are the big ones as a christian uh reading and rereading the bible understanding it uh, better as I became older, uh, questioning it and uh, reaffirming its truth and value has, has been big. Um, not that I ever really deeply questioned uh, the historicity of Jesus and uh, his divine nature, but it's, it's good to, you know, look at it and see where, where you, where, where you're at, how you feel and uh, not be a, a blindly believing christian but to to look at it and be honest and I, I think god appreciates that and doesn't take offense so i've done that you know throughout my life and especially to write uh modules three 
which I said is all about God and, and women, uh, I had a lot of thinking to do in some areas and uh, challenging and, and revisiting uh, my faith in a, in a couple of areas. So, yeah, between the Bible, uh, Jeff Cooper, Doug Casey, Ayn Rand, um, Howard Ruff back then, uh, Robert J. Ringer, you know, you've read one of his books that he was big in the 70s. And back in the 70s was the beginning of the first survival movement. It was the, the extreme dissatisfaction with the Carter malaise, awful time to be an American in, you know, 1978 and 79 and, and 80. And Reagan's uh, election was uh, truly a breath of fresh air. So I, I grew up in an, in an interesting era of high inflation and, 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 and grotesque Democrat socialism uh, policies. And we're going to see that again. We're going to see high inflation and more grotesque democratic socialism. Are we? Uh, would you say that we're in it now? This is one of the challenges uh, that this is one of the problems that I have with the fourth turning is that it's always something that's going to happen tomorrow. And I, I might, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm starting to wonder if that we're actually in the we are in the hard times now. Like, yeah, the hard the hard times are beginning. I, I the hard mean, times I, are just beginning. There's a, there's a part of me that occasionally becomes optimistic that looks mm -hmm. at the time that we live in right now and say uh, that, that, that uh, there's, a, there's a part of me that becomes occasionally optimistic and looks at the hard time that we're in right now and say, and, and say, right. and say to myself that this is actually the hard time, mm -hmm. particularly in an example of I remember preparing for a selection process for the military. And by the time I got there, it was not difficult. Let's just use land navigation as an example. By the time I got to ranger school, land navigation yeah. was easy for me. Right. I had started right. learning how to do land nav when I was 13 years old in Boy Scouts. So getting there and learning how to do a map and compass and protractor mm -hmm. was not a challenge. So I remember doing that and, and right. seeing people sweat bullets and lose their minds over trying to find a, a rod in the middle of the woods. <laughs> But like at that yeah. point in time, it was easy for me. And part of me wonders if some of what we're experiencing now is actually the hard times, that it's not going to be tomorrow. It's not going to be next month. It's literally today, because what are we looking at? Uh, gay sex in the White House as a, a, like just or not in the White House, in the in, in, in like the halls of Congress as a movie being released or this yeah. sort of. The, the the current presidents that were live the current president and administration that we're living at can be described as nothing other than a colonizing buffoon who's going about parading his debauchery in front of the country saying you can't look at me look how bad I am like mm -hmm. there's no way that you can look at the presidency of Biden and his and what has been described been going on since 2020 as nothing other than the literal biblical um celebration of evil in the streets and i think that right. in some ways we may find ourselves looking back at today as mm -hmm. that dark period and the and the and the dawn is tomorrow mm -hmm. and, I, and i hope that people are re are willing to look at that yeah i think this is the beginning of the hard times um, okay I, I remember when clinton was elected in 92 and uh, gun owners and militia people thought it was the end. Mm -hmm. uh, looking back on Clinton 30 years later, he was actually a, a, a remarkably centrist president. And uh, that we, we would prefer to, to be living under Bill Clinton uh, today than, than, than Biden. You know, the big hoop flaw back then with Clinton was his obviously infidelities and Monica Lewinsky and all that. That is so mild compared to today in the in the senate gay porn you know tape uh in the senate hall and uh the the, the transgender movement and the uh, obnoxious arrogance of the lgbt so-called community you know back when i was a kid and anita bryant was uh chastising the gays it's adam and eve not adam and steve you know the homosexuals were just becoming really, uh noisome at that time and they would say, look, we just want to be with each other. We're not trying to uh, uh, remake society and we're not trying to adopt children and all that. Uh, yeah, they are trying to remake society and they are adopting children. And so things have curdled very badly. So I would say these are the beginning of the hard times uh, okay. where this, this, the, the moral center 
of America has been eaten out like termites and some of the structures beginning to collapse because the load bearing beams have been eaten out morally. Mm -hmm. I, 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 your sentiment is not alone. That's for sure. And I can imagine mm -hmm. you've, you know, many like-minded people who hear those things and go, yes, 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 of course. Like it's not news anymore. Yeah, I remember when the mm -hmm. whole phrase like, oh, people need to wake up was such a like a common talking point. And I think we're past yeah. that now. I really think right. we're past that. Like if you're you're either conscious or you're a casualty and there's or, no like, or or an accomplice or yeah. an accomplice. Yeah. Where did you did I did I pull that from one of your books a long time ago? I, I, <laughs> Who knows? Uh, man, this is Maybe. this is uh, this is disappointing. This is a. Uh, Almost a little bit um, deja vu, but like I've heard. This right, before. it's surreal. It's an echo of. Uh, it's like who said that first? Who said that first? Um, yeah. Well, it's not a bad place to be. Well, as as uh, the line goes, when when an honest but mistaken man realizes his error, he either ceases to be mistaken or he ceases to be honest. Hmm. And so at this point, uh what's going on in society is so obvious that you either have to become the enemy of that and if you don't become the enemy you're the you've been the accomplice without knowing it and you certainly are you know the the uh, mm -hmm. knowing accomplice from here on out things are just so in in their in our faces um by design they're just rubbing our face in the crap on purpose uh, and so Americans really have to pick a side and uh, find themselves again, find God again, find at least a moral compass again. And we could have a free country in a year. We could burn all this out and off in a year and have an amazing uh, paradise of America if we had the will. But uh, we're not one country anymore. We're actually two countries. Hmm. And and I've argued for 25 years that we're going to have, or we should have, a uh, old divorce, a secession of states. Uh, we should go through what Czechoslovakia went through, and realize, look, you know, it's going to be Czech Republic here and Slovenia over there. Uh, we're we're just not one country anymore, and Humpty Dumpty can't hmm. put it back together again. We've seen cultural. Uh, cultural, let's call it manifestations of this uh, zeitgeist coming out, was particularly with the movie Civil War coming out in April of this mm -hmm. coming year. Um, mm -hmm. Hence, hence the uh, you know, and hence the red sunglasses. Um, we've seen, we're starting to see that come up. We there are people uh, who have influence who are talking about it. Whether it's Tucker Carlson, I don't think he's mentioned it, but I'm not mm -hmm. sure. Uh, Tim Pool, who I have spoken to in the past mm -hmm. uh there are there's kind of joe rogan shows kind of occasionally bring up the subject you see it in the news you see it in social media you see it we i think and and i think this movie that's coming out by a24 is an important cultural moment because mm -hmm. it is about it it its attitude is different its attitude mm -hmm. is different. It, it's a, its aesthetic is different than the, what do you call it? Its aesthetic and attitude is different than the sort of polar reds versus grays or blues versus grays conflict. And it's very Bosnian and it's, in it's, is mm -hmm. in its aesthetic. And so yeah. what is your take on, I know civil war is a phrase that people like to use, but what's your take on civil war and 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 divorce, and what and how that could even happen, or what it would look like, and what what's the the goal or the ideal? Well, if the uh, secession of states begins in the western rural western mountainous areas, the the so called western redoubt of uh, Montana, Idaho, Wyoming maybe part of South Dakota and so forth. I, I think our, our answer will be similar to what Taiwan has done. They've never said the S word, the secession word, but they've for decades lived an increasingly separate life from main, mainland communist China. 
I think if the Western inland states, probably joined by quite a few of the Southern states, can increasingly live uh, separate lives from the federal government, we can make the federal government increasingly uh, theoretical. Now this began, I, I believe, with uh, a lot of states passing uh, marijuana friendly laws, I mean, decriminalizing marijuana. In direct you know, uh, uh, dispute or conflict with acts of Congress, you know, criminalizing marijuana. The fact that states have gotten away with that is, can be a huge lesson that there's more they can get away with. There's more they can uh, snub the federal government about because they've already proven the feds are not monolithically uh, powerful. They can't enforce, you know, 20 feet of, of congressional law on the books. They're not omnipotent. And so the feds had to give up on, on the criminalization of uh, decriminalization of marijuana. And I think the states uh, can learn from that and start to muscle their way into a true Second Amendment society and uh, a lot of Title 18 stuff. You know, Biden's trying to uh, outlaw private sales at gun shows, trying to make everybody who sells a gun a, a deal. And I think that's, that could be the next thing that certain states go, eh, not here. No, we're just not going to enforce that. And you can't enforce I, I, it on high without our help anyway. Yeah, that's a, I think that's actually a, a hallmark of, of encouragement or a hallmark of character within gun culture is that they're not, for mm -hmm. all of the criticisms that's thrown at gun culture for, the, for it being extremely materialistic, they are concerned about exactly those kinds of things. We are exactly concerned about, look, it's not about mm -hmm. whether or not I have the latest version of Knight's Armaments SR-15 or whatever the newest gun of the thing the day is, right? Really, what the things that cut yeah. to the quick in our concern are uh, abstract objects. The law of the land is trying to be altered by perhaps unjust means in order to put you in a position where you are not allowed to technically own your own property. And I think that's an issue. Uh -huh. So... Right. I th that's a good example of it. All the, the the slings and arrows that are thrown at us turn out not to not only be ineffective but turn into kindling because mm. we're not the, the 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 community is not sleeping on the on these things all the time. Given yeah. there's burnout, I mean, I can't be vigilant every day, every hour of every day. But there is mm. um, that's a good thing. That is a very good thing. All right. So then, I need to go back to this because. The mar I think there's a trap in the marijuana problem, though, and that is mm -hmm. that, and this is a bit of, it's a little bit simplified, but the, the, the individual states choosing to decriminalize marijuana is generally perceived as being a left-wing political movement, generally mm -hmm. perceived as, yeah. right? Um, and this is where you might get conservatives, libertarians, and uh, progressives in conflict with one another, maybe even arguing a sense over who has some sort of responsibility for it. I think the trap that's being laid, though, is that gun culture is looking at the way that states have decriminalized marijuana and said, look, they did it there. We can do it, too. The mm -hmm. trap is that they are going to, the whoever the metaphorical they are, are going to honor that as a legitimate argument. In other words, if we go to, say, something like the courts and say the states legitimized decriminalization of marijuana through cultural movements we can, we we can do it too look at us we're doing it too we're going to be responded mm -hmm. with force in the boot and the answer is um don't expect a liar to to be honest and and i think that's where the challenge mm. is I, I i'm not being specific hmm. about it let me use it this way um it's not hypocrisy it's it's hierarchy this is a phrase that i think jack mm. jack uh jack 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 jack, jack, jack um what's his name jack um donovan no posobic oh jack Pasobic, yeah. he the the political guy has talked about it. it's not it's not it's not um it's not hypocrisy it's hierarchy or hierarchy mm -hmm. and while gun culture can look to 
how states have decriminalized marijuana as a sense of cultural inspiration, they should not see it as legal precedence because that will be mm. used against you. 100%. Mm. Steamroll through I just and push them out of the way. I, just, I see the uh, marijuana decriminalization as kind of an exercise, a return of states' rights, which has never okay. been a left-wing thing. Um, so I'm just looking at it in, in that regard. Um, I don't know how much those particular states actually challenged uh, the drug laws in the courts. I think they just went ahead and did what they did. And uh, the feds pissed and moaned about it, but realized they just didn't have the enforcement apparatus if those states weren't going to help in the enforcement apparatus. And uh, I think the feds just realized, yeah, I uh, guess we got to let them have this one. There's nothing much we can do about it. It became a phenomenon um, and the laws became irrelevant. And I think the gun rights and Second Amendment uh, culture can also become a phenomenon that the laws can't get to anymore. We didn't have such a gun culture. Culture, as I said, in the 70s and 80s, uh, that that became new. Now, like I said, a soccer mom has her, you know, Smith and Wesson shield in her, you know, Gucci purse, and the Second Amendment is not abstract to her. It means something to her. This is her gun, and she's protecting her children. Very much. And so, so I, I think the gun, the, the gun culture, has really become a culture. I, I wouldn't have called the gun culture much of a culture, you know, 30 years ago, but it is now. It's a big deal. People shoot for fun. People take gun ownership and wearing their guns seriously. Uh, and that that has caused the retraction of the uh, the hoplophobes, as Cooper puts it, the people that have an irrational fear of weapons. Yes, I you think know, the, our the, culture the, is marching on and there's not much that can be done about it. And that's the attitude that I want to carry forward. So let's wrap this episode up because I think we've I think we've exhausted two really good well not exhausted intellectually completely but we we we've, we've covered two really good topics and I think it's yeah it's a really good way to enter into the Christmas season for a lot of the people. Yes. One of the things that I want to do one of the things that I appreciate in our culture is we're starting to move away from doom and gloom and start saying these are good things that are happening. Uh -huh. So uh thank you for bringing some of that really. Kenneth, Mr. Royce, uh, if, if I must, thank you very much for some of the, 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 the good news in this sense that you've brought forward. So I want to end a little You're bit welcome. on a bit. I want to end a little bit on a personal note, and I have not had the opportunity to read. I have not taken the opportunity. I'll, I'll, I'll take responsibility for myself. I've not taken the <laughs> opportunity to, to read the third. Uh, the third book in the series on modules for manhood, but uh, now I'm going to get start. I'm going to have to get started on that pretty soon. Um, I'll send you a copy. Thank you very much. I, I I appreciate that. The something that has been important for me this year is in my relationship with God, my Christian relationship. Uh, one of the challenge. One of the one of the this year could be described a little bit as the long dark night of the soul. If you're familiar with St. John and the cross and his mm -hmm. his talk about that, um, where I don't know when the end of the tunnel is, but I know that there is an end of the mm. tunnel. I don't, you know, I don't see the light, but I know it's there. And it has required me to, okay. it has required me to uh, become dependent on God in ways that are, extremely uncomfortable whether it's yeah. foundations of intellect like how can i even understand something dealing with issues of tbi or whatever uh whether it's financial mm -hmm. provisions or, or 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 even a sense of meaning and purpose um mm -hmm. and in in your in your book that you're in your last book that you're talking about god um one of the things that I appreciate in gun culture and, and especially something that we're seeing in the West is that when I was a young man, especially in the military and a little bit around that era, people would talk about themselves being Christians kind of like an abused, like they're in an, an abused relationship. Like, uh -huh. well, they, they, they'd be very apologetic about it. They wouldn't want to be too forceful. And it was so character, characteristically the opposite of the Bible thumping Mm -hmm. Again, caricature. Um, but now I think we're in that we're in the part where 
like it's not a it's not an apology to become a Christian anymore. It's very much so yeah. the calling that so many young men are on. What is a mm-hmm. word of advice or of maybe not even mentorship that you would offer to those who are listening on faith particularly? Hmm. Well, even uh, agnostics and atheists operate on faith. Faith is, okay. is part of the human condition. You have to have faith that someone you just meet is not going to kill you. You have to faith have faith that, that the chair that you've never sat in is not going to collapse underneath you. We, we take a million things every day on faith. Uh, so faith is, is, is not just the purview of, of the Christian or, or the spiritual. It's just part of being human. Um, there's a line that says of scripture that, you know, faith is evidence of things unseen, the hope of, you know, things not yet to be. Um, and you know, a, a, as a Christian who has faith, I'm, I'm required to have more faith tomorrow than I have today. Faith, faith is constantly requiring of growth and it, it never ends. And that's the uncomfortable part because what feels as if part of you has to give way to that faith, it's like as if you're losing part of yourself. But looking back on it, uh, your only true authentic self, as C.S. Lewis would say, comes from being in Christ, not being on your own and not being some allegedly autonomous person that doesn't need God, doesn't believe in God, and that's my true self. It's the other way around, and that's the hard thing to wrap your mind around. Um, when I became a Christian, or anybody co- becomes a Christian, at first you're donning a shirt that says Jesus on it and the name tag. Uh, let me see if I've got that right, because it's, it's a wonderful example. Yeah, at the end, of your Christian walk, if you do it right, you become Jesus that has your name on the name tag on the shirt. You're just a form of Jesus, but being expressed through you know your human uh, nature, your human uh, personality and so forth. And so the ideal, well, he's the savior. He's, he's the one that we hearken to and so Apostle Paul, as I decrease, he increases in me. And that's the uncomfortable part because, as I said, you feel like you're losing yourself and becoming someone else. Well, you're becoming the person that you should have been all along, that the original Adam was, uh, so to speak. Uh, Just take it day by day. Uh, You know, we have no surprises from God. As human beings, as an individual person, there's nothing he doesn't know or understand about us. And he's, he's, he grades on a curve. He, he is very gracious. And uh, not to make so much of a big deal about oh, faith. Um, just trust him more and more as you can. And uh, you'll see that trust, that faith redeemed. And all faith is, is acting as if God has been telling the truth. That's all faith really is. It's just a belief that, you know, he, he has been truthful and he has our best interest uh, at heart for us. And just believing that and acting on that. And we have to do that incrementally. And over time, uh, you can look back and see what a journey you've made over time. But yeah, here and there, it, it's painful. It is uncomfortable. Yeah. But so w- when, you, human, when you use the word... Being, human beings are not their own answer. That, that's that's the thing to really take at heart. Human beings are not our own answer. We're not going to figure this out. We're not going to create a paradise uh, by ourselves. Uh, we're mostly the problem, our own problem. And to, to get our ego out of the way of this and trust the creator. We're just the creatures. And we have our, our place in all this. But we are the creatures and not the creator. So just relax and let that happen. When you say acting in that phrase, acting as if God is going to do what he says he's going to do or he is honest in his words yeah i'm 
I, the word acting can be taken two different ways. It can be referred to as acting like an actor, like uh, um, pretending, mm -hmm. or it can be in more of the, the when actions right. are used in philosophical language of deliberate choice or doing a thing. It is a cause, an action creates a thing. Um, are you referring to the prior right. or the latter, or is the distinction between those two just making it more complicated? No, it's it's mostly the latter. But uh, as C.S. Lewis, Lewis puts it, he said, "You may not feel like doing a kind thing, acting out of kindness, mm -hmm. but go ahead and act as if you're the actor, right? And you don't want to do this. You don't want to be kind. But as you do the thing." Doing it changes you, and you become more kind by having done it, even though you didn't want to. You didn't feel it. So maybe at first you are the actor, right? But then that transforms into the latter example that you mentioned, and uh, the act changes you, even though you didn't really, you weren't into it, you didn't feel it. But you just have to, you know, as they say in the military, you don't have to like it, you just have to do it. <laughs> right you yeah probably heard that a few times i have de i have definitely heard that yeah there is the uh there is right. this one the, the phenomenon of like false motivation like you have to look like you're having a good time like i'm not enjoying this right now sometimes and that's it's, okay right yeah sometimes it's dumb but sometimes it actually turns out to be its own solution which is the uh um, right. the genesis of dark humor in that right uh you know uh the uh, there's there's a series of jokes that go along but it's it is there's a certain thing of like hey i don't have to i don't have to enjoy it authentically but if i start i, I at least start to try then authenticity comes behind it exactly so, right good right well um well mr royce where's the best way for people to find your works where's the best way for people to find your books where is it is there a, a hub a website a center point do you are you extremely yeah. active on social media how does this work uh javelin press is uh, my publishing company j-a-v-e-l-i-n press.com um all my books can be found through there Amazon used to sell everything, but I've been cancel cultured for most of my uh, uh, paper books in order for them to uh, have Kindle sales. They, they've, that's their, their actual stated philosophy is to drive out the small publishers and force them into selling ebooks, which cost them nothing to, to warehouse. So uh, before one could get all my books on Amazon, now they're acting like, ah, it's currently unavailable and you know, we don't know and all that. So just go to javelinpress.com. Uh, it has um, an email address you know, inside there. So we can start with that. Um, I was on Twitter uh, fairly actively and I just got uh, suspended about a month or two ago for saying something apparently a little too edgy about uh, the unchecked immigration, especially, I think what what uh, kicked me off was, uh, got me kicked off. I was talking about the Italian island that has been inundated by thousands of uh, Northern Africans. And I said, just sink a few boats, you know, word will get back, you know, through the Bush Telegraph and uh, they'll stop coming over. And so that was considered, you know, violent talk, even though I didn't say kill them. I just said, sink their boats, you know, let them, let them be in the water for a little while and realize they're not going to make it you know to the mainland so i got kicked off of twitter i'm on gab gab.com but that's the extent of my social media yeah i uh i i in started interacting with you on on twitter now x and then you disappeared and uh i don't right. know what how I'm, like i'm not worried about myself getting canceled off the platform necessarily because um the one negative thing that i think Elon Musk has done is that it the the primary it's it's all engagement farming now. It's just people saying ridiculous right. things so that people will comment on it. So they're going to make their half a penny, and it's the same thing that you right. see in like um, I, what's the it's is it is it considered the soy jack? I don't remember what the the meme thing is, but you see it in um, YouTube thumbnails. It's some dude with his mouth open, pointing at a thing, and you're like. Oh, he's, oh, that guy. Yeah, yeah, right. yeah. I, I can't yeah. take it. See well, it's it's people now. It's not just like the cartoon. It's actual people's faces. Is that's how they? It's and I, you can't take it seriously. 
So it is what it is. It's right. effective. It, it catches attention. Uh, is this? Uh, can you see it? Can you see it on the the screen right now? Is this the? This is this is what I pulled up. Javelin Press. Uh, I don't sure. see it on my screen. I don't see okay. it on my screen, but uh, I'm still a little. I'm still learning how to, how to do it. But I, we have javelinpress.com up on the, on the uh, on yeah. the screen for those who are watching on YouTube right now, and this is this Thank looks you. like it yeah. is your collection. And I want to send people there because I I I'm I'm, I'm going to say it too. I think these are good books to have on your page, uh, on your on your on your on a, every young man's library. Um, I read a I Thank heard you. I saw. A, a demonstration on again on social media with some of its its benefits is that I think it was King Trout talking about how someone was criticizing him for having a book on his bookshelf, and his argument was anyone with an IQ above ninety can read something that they don't agree with and recognize that there's a separation between the right. idea and the book and their own person. So right. So yeah, no, thank you very much. Uh, from from one man to another, thank you very much for what you've uh, the time that you've put into the world to put into a book, and I hope to have another conversation with you in the future. Thank you, Forrest. Me too. I had a good yeah. time, and uh, thank you all for for watching. I hope you enjoyed it, and uh, I would love to be back on again. Let's uh, let's schedule that for the future. For those who are still listening and those who are still watching, if you want to pick up a book from or any of the modules of manhood from Kenneth Royce, you can head over to javelinpress.com. And then if you want to support our show, I think I'll try to put something up on it on our Locals page. So if you want to support us, you can head over to redactedculture.locals.com. We're using Locals because it's a little bit more secure than Patreon. And then in addition to that, we you can head over to redactedllc.com. And if you want to support us through this store there we've got a pre-order going on right now at the time of recording that includes a pair of the red sunglasses that are featured in the trailer for civil war the purpose of that is to take advantage of the slings and arrows thrown at us and turn them into our own kindling so if you want to jump in on that pre-order there's a shirt and sunglasses combo which we expect to see quite a bit in 2024 uh, Mr. Right. Royce, thank you very much for your time. And for those who are listening, thank you very much for paying attention to. This has been the Redacted Culture Cast. And as we close with, go forth and conquer. Amen. <laughs>